Hello YouTube. Today we're going to talk about setup on mandolins because everybody likes something different and this could be something that if you haven't put much thought into it could help you with your playing and make you want to spend more time with your instrument. If it's not fun to play your mandolin you're just not going to pick it up get it out of the case as often. So before I go into any of this I want to say right up front that this the setups on my mandolins have been done by Danny Roberts for probably close to 25 years. He's been doing this stuff for me. And our relationship started with the Wayne Benson signature model at Gibson that I was so grateful for. And he really knows my play and he knows my approach and has a real sensibility to the setup that I like on the mandolin. I feel like everybody's is going to be different because no two instruments are the same and no two players are the same. That's something that he and I had a conversation about before a few weeks ago. He did a fret dress and touched up the nut and just tweaked on my McClanahan for me to get it ready for a recording session. So things that we discussed, and I'm going to try to edit some pictures into this video to get the point across the action i'm just going to start at the nut the action at the nut such a critical setup this can be if this is too high it's going to make it really hard to play the mandolin in first position not just at the first fret but if you're playing a fiddle tune in the key of g or d or whatever in first position it's going to be uncomfortable if that action is high at the nut and you can get by with really low action up here because the strings are not moving that much. Nowhere, not as nearly as much as they are like at the 12th fret, which is the middle of the scale. OK, so here a common thing. And you can if you're looking at this picture of the nut, if you were to um, if you were to play or not play, but just to put your finger on the third fret and press down on the G string. When you do that, and you could grab your mandolin right now and do this, if you press that string down, there's going to be a very minimal amount of clearance between the top of the first fret and the bottom of the G string. Okay, that amount, whatever you have right there, that distance could be measured in thousandths of an inch. And, and that, to me, is a point of reference. You, whatever that number might be, for some people it's going to be more, for some people it's going to be less, depending on how hard you ever play the G string open. And, and the if you're doing pull-offs and that kind of thing in first position, of course this would probably apply more to the D, A, and the E string. All of those things are going to make a difference. And it's logical, if you were all the way up here, again, at the in first position looking at the nut if we were playing the e string on the third fret that measurement's going to be something different between the top of the first fret and the bottom of the e string you're going to be able to have lower action on the e and a strings at the nut than you are on the d and the g because they do move more as they vibrate this is something again you can measure that in um you know, and, and try to make a science out of it. But the conversation that Danny and I were having, these um, increments are debatable from one player to the next. So it's bigger than the science of those numbers. Everybody's technique, everybody's style is different. Every mandolin's a little bit different. OK, if we approach this as kind of like going sh just down the neck of the mandolin, the next thing that would... Uh, definitely come to mind would be the truss rod adjustment. You're going to be looking for a particular amount of relief in the neck. The more relief that you have in the neck, the higher your action is going to be. But if the neck's too straight, then it's more likely to buzz or something like that. And also to reveal to you if you have a high fret somewhere. I've had to overcome that before just in a situation on the road and would have to put more relief in the neck than I really wanted because a fret buzz would develop in the winter time or just with an older instrument and the fretboard gets dry and the frets are able to move around. Ideally, the frets would have been leveled in that situation, but with a truss rod adjustment, 
you can if you let pressure off of the truss rod it puts more relief in the neck and if you tighten the truss rod it pulls the neck straighter so that again is going to be different for every player if your neck's too straight and you're a bluegrass player you're not going to be able to get a really clean chop there's you're going to have i call them fret farts and it's going to happen when you're playing rhythm if the action's not high enough for that to be clean so you're looking for that sweet spot on in your technique. What's how high can or how low can you have the action and still get a clean chop and still play stylistically the way that you want to. So that's going to again for ev for each person that's going to vary. The science of it says one thing but the person's playing and technique says something else okay on to the bridge this is a really big deal and i'm gonna refer you guys to a video that i did right when i first started the channel during COVID. it was probably one of the first half a dozen videos that i made and it's about bridge placement and setting the bridge for best intonation so if you wanted to check that video out, it's in the thumbnail. There's a picture of me and it says tune it or die. And I edited some clips from Smokey and the Bandit into the video, which is really weird to think about having enough time to be doing something like that. But that's an example of, of the COVID years that we all went through. But just a quick touch on this, and it goes into a lot of detail on options that you have with the bridge in that video. But the string height, this is probably as big. I, I, I think of the action, how high the action, there are two things that determine that. The neck relief or how straight it is and the, how tall the bridge is. So you're going to find the sweet spot between those things. If you straighten the neck, the action is going to even go down some at the nut. And then after you did that, you might be able to raise the bridge a little bit. And you'll be able to hear a tonal difference in the mandolin because it changes the tension on the top. So that's where we get into trying to work the setup into the sound of the mandolin as well. And each instrument, I think you have to own an instrument and play it for a considerable length of time before you can figure all this out. And you might get lucky and just and grab a mandolin and it's doing exactly what you want it to, that's going to be way more likely to happen if you're buying a top-end instrument. If you're if you're playing an Eastman or a, one of the mandolins that says the lore on it or a Kentucky mandolin like the one that I'm doing the series mandolin on a budget that I'm about to finish up, if you're playing an instrument in that price range, more than likely the setup from the factory isn't going to be to its optimum thing for whoever would play the instrument. So these are just things to consider. If you get a chance, if you know somebody that owns a mandolin that's maybe a more advanced player than you, instead of just looking at their musicianship and what they do, check out their setup on the instrument. I know that players like Tony Rice, you know, he was critical of the way that his instrument was set up. And I think I'm satisfied that that caused him to want to play it more and that he wouldn't have picked as much if he felt like he was in a fight with his guitar to be able to play it. And then you develop a sensibility to the instrument the way that he would have. I've heard people say that they couldn't get anything out of Tony's guitar. But for him, he knew the setup, every little thing that was going to happen with it. He was in touch with it. You should have that kind of a relationship with your mandolin and you should understand the basics of how all this works to get it to play the way that you want it to. So once again, um, Danny Roberts is the guy that has done this for me. He's not sponsoring the video or anything. I like to say that this is just sponsored by the truth. But if you're looking for a setup, it wouldn't be a bad idea to reach out to him. I hope this helps. Maybe it's just eye-opening for you if you haven't thought about the importance in this.